young man loved church. He was just a young man, but he just loved the things about church. He loved even the sermon. He loved the songs. He loved all the opportunities that seemed to surround the experience known as church. And so the only thing he had difficulty with, and certainly that's not the case with me, but he had particularly, his pastor had particularly long pastoral prayers. And he said he would just just lose his mind thinking about all the other things while his pastor was praying. Well, that was fairly contained until one day when the pastor had been invited to come to his home to share in a dinner meal with the family. And so he dreaded it. He said, I couldn't believe that they were actually inviting him to our home. He was starving after the service. And so he just was concerned about how long the pastor would pray before they'd actually eat. And so he was surprised when the pastor ended up praying, Oh, Lord, bless this home, bless this food, and use us in your service in Jesus' name. He couldn't believe it. And so he uttered out without even thinking, he looked at the pastor and said, man, you don't mess around when you're hungry, do you? Well, it's that time of year. It really is when we are hungry. I mean, church has lit us up. We've had so many incredibly positive situations with our music program last week. We've got multiple opportunities coming up this week. And how all those dots seem to connect together in terms of leading us back to Bethlehem and all that that means. So my hope is that you've been encouraged and that you have found yourself hungry. Hungry to know and to believe what it is that we call Christmas, the coming of the Christ child. And for those of you who came to know Christ as an adult, like I did, it was so very different when I came to know Christ and how I, ce I celebrated Christmas so differently when that event began to happen. So Jesus came at Christmas to do something for us that we could not, in fact, do for ourselves. And that is he came as Savior to save us from ourselves and ultimately our sin. Some years ago, a lady by the name of Karen uh, was decided that she was going to be a missionary, and so she traveled over into a foreign land in Africa, and she was, I believe, a nurse or a medical aide somehow, but she served in the Methodist Mission Hospital there. God had called her for this special healing ministry, and she was very, very excited and encouraged about it. The problem is she had never spent uh, a Christmas without her family, and so uh, we hear that song each year, uh, wanting to be home for Christmas. She certainly wanted that, but in this case, it was not going to happen. She didn't make very much money where she served, and so she was trying to think of something to do for the family. She knew she didn't really have time or really the financial uh, where being to be able to send packages back home for Christmas. So she got creative one day and took a large piece of poster board and made them a special gift. What they received um, on a few days before Christmas was this package, and it said on there, please open on Christmas morning with the whole family. And so typically that's what they did. They gathered for Christmas Eve services and then spent the night together and had Christmas the next morning, and they were opening the gifts, and at the end they ch decided to pull hers up and open it. And within the package there were several smaller packages, and each of them had the piece of this poster that she had written on. So sure enough, they began to notice that no matter how many family members, they, they, all the pieces fit together, and ultimately she had put together a board that said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you, I give to you my heart. Christmas is that time of year where we do find solace and encouragement when we find out that we can give our heart to Christ, and in so doing, not only do we learn to love God, but we learn to love others in an unusual way. And that's the Christmas story. You've got it in your folder today, and it is from the, new, uh, it's from the message version. And my wife said, you, met, you read it much too quickly in the early service. So if I go down to slower pace in this service, no, I'm not going to do it that bad. But nevertheless, she says, make sure, you know, it's very familiar to you. So it is familiar, and it's familiar to most of us, but it's a new translation. It's a little different. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken through the empire. 
This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean city of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. And as a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to a son, her firstborn, wrapped him in a blanket, laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the hostel. And there were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. And suddenly the God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, Do not be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has been born in, da in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. So we're going to talk about that one punchline there that oh, every two or three years we have to settle in on that if you think about the meaning of Christmas. And it is that ultimately Christmas is about room. It is about making room for the coming of the Christ child. If you were here for our musical production last week, you saw a very moving video about that whole event. And like I often say at Christmas, you either have to believe it that it is this crazy true story or it's just a mere fairy tale because it's either one or the other and for me obviously I'm basing my life on the fact that it is absolutely true. So if you want to follow along in your folder, uh, if we want to make room for Christ, he will save us from our disillusionment. If there is a more famous story about Christmas I'm not aware of outside of the one in the Bible. It is the Christmas Carol. And Neva and I, for a number of years, uh, when we lived in uh, Louisville while I was going to seminary, we would go to Actors Theater, which is one of the better uh, theaters there is in the world, really. It's world-renowned and uh, have lots of famous actors come in for that. But we would go every year. And so... I remember um, just the whole event. And so if you haven't seen it, all you have to do is turn on your television and roll the stations this time of year. You'll find it. I mean, I found it last night. I was just, just wondering. And so I popped it in, went through the 416,000 channels that we all have now. And sure enough, it was there. But it's a classic story. If you have not uh, seen it or are familiar with it, it's Charles Dickens' novel. And he had this character by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, I've seen lots of pictures of Ebenezer, but I've never seen one quite like this one. Is that a good picture or what? I mean, that's a classic picture of the bah humbug guy that he was. That was his phrase. And if you ever hear that phrase, you're basically saying disillusioned person. Bah humbug. I don't believe all that stuff. But you know the story. Tiny Tim Cratchit was a little boy who... Um, was uh, crippled, and so his dad worked for Ebenezer. And so uh, the phrase that would often come out of the Cratchit family, in particular Tiny Tim, the phrase that would often come out was, God bless us, everyone. You would hear that over and over again. But Scrooge needed something in his life. He needed a conversion of sorts. He was a selfish, arrogant, greedy hard-hearted, mean-spirited, uncaring, unsympathetic, unchristian tightwad. And that's the best I could say about him. <laughs> he was not a good person. And if you see that, you see him encounter two things. Two things turned him around. First of all, he got scared to death <laughs> by three ghosts who visited him. Past, present, and future ghosts visited him. And if that won't set you straight, not much will. But he also had, against that backdrop of the fear that he saw with the ghost, he also had this amazing love that he saw within the Cratchit family. They always loved him. They always accepted him, no matter how bad he really was. But after that moment, after those, that incredible night where he woke up and found out that he was still living, his life dramatically changed. He gave money to the church of all places. He gave, um, he went to his nephews who he had been estranged from and he actually gave 
uh, Mr. Cratchit a raise uh, who had worked for him, Bob Cratchit. But in all of that, you see, it's not simply an old Christmas story told by Charles Dickens. It's a story that all of us know because it's a story about us. There is always a part of us that is mean or distant from God or selfish. That ultimately, when we move over to find that other place where we are, in fact, close to God, we experience a kind of change that makes us want to scream like that. And we just want to feel that change in our lives. And so that's the way it happens oftentimes. We experience something, we know that change, and we make our way there. Now, one of the things that we theologians, you know, those of us who think about God all the time, um, and really any serious Christian, you've come to the point in your life where you have to sim simply believe, okay, if, if God wants me not to be disillusioned, if he wants me to move out of this disillusionment in my life and grab onto something real, is it just about me trying as best I can or is it God doing it all for me? And we theologians call that the difference between freedom and, and uh, human agency and divine sovereignty. You know, how does it all play out? How, what part do we play? What part does God play in that? And I remember early in my Christian walk, I remember hearing people tell me, well, just let God be God. Just let God be God and that will be fine. Or uh, let, let go and let God. You know, just let go. Well, I, I never did let go very good, so that one didn't work for me. And then I began carrying one around that I really carried around for a number of years. It was a little saying like this, what you are is God's gift to you. What you do with what you are is your gift to God. And that one worked for a little while, but it really kind of lent itself to, to the fact that it, it shows God's in the balcony and he's looking over the balcony at us and he's hoping we'll do better and he cheers us when we do better. But as I was reading my devotional this past week by Jim Dennison, he talked about a little theology book by Fisher Humphreys. It's entitled Thinking About God. And he pulled out a little simple phrase that I had not heard. He said, really the best way to balance that is to understand it this way. As we work, God works. In other words, as we lean into God, as we ask God to help us, as we begin thinking good and godly thoughts as we open our hearts to love others that are not very lovable when we give god our best in our service and in our preparation then god gives his best in return i keep a little thing a little saying near my desk it goes something like this the holy spirit has a strange affinity for the trained mind now what does that mean for those of us like me, who, who, who do this thing called ministry and who, who, who is a pastor, I, you know, it would be awfully easy to stand up here and talk for 20 minutes each week and just kind of speak from the cuff. But for me, it's always been, uh, I need to bring my very best to this event. I need to study. I need to prepare. I need to make not only the, the word relevant, but I need to make it revelatory. And that means life-changing. And so for me, always... I feel like I'm in, this, um, I'm in this, this relationship with the Spirit of God that allows us to hold the newspaper in one hand, the Bible in the other, and to speak out of that. The fact is that God could make us robots that he controls, but rather he makes us children that he loves. And that's the difference. That's the difference. You and I are not robots. We are children, and God loves us. And what better time of the year than this time of year to think about that? So God, if we make room for Christ, he will take care of our disillusionment, but also he will save us from defeat. There's been a little bit of defeat in my life this week, and I'm gonna, uh, this year, and I'm going to talk about that, but I read uh, a story that I, um, it kind of inspired me this week. Uh, one of them a little bit silly, but it's tied to one that's very, very serious. Um, some of you may remember uh, a store by the name of Montgomery Ward. How many of you remember Montgomery Ward? Yeah, about half of us. I thought the oldest. Montgomery Ward, there was a man in 1939, Robert May, who worked in the publicity department of Montgomery Ward, and they were asking him to come up with a new, kind of a new image for Christmas. So he's thinking, he took the image of the ugly duckling and uh, the image of the Santa Claus, and he put those two together, and what he came up with was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. 
And if you read that story, know about that story, you know that uh, it's quite popular today. And how it played out was it caught on and it began distributed six million coloring books the following year telling the story of Rudolph. And then Robert May's story caught on so popular that by 1949, Mr. May's brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, wrote a song, and guess who recorded it? Gene Autry. Some of, that, of you will know that name. He recorded it, and of course, the rest is history. Now, that's not simply a little cute, child-friendly story. It is a story that inspires us because it tells us about someone, even an animal, rising from defeat turning a handicap into an advantage. And that got me to thinking about another Rudolph of sorts. In the summer of 1960, Wilma Rudolph was the greatest, one of the greatest female athletes of all time. A long-legged young lady from Clarksville, Tennessee, won not one, but three gold medals at the 1960 Olympics. Now, what is amazing about her um, is the fact that for the first third of her life, her leg, left leg, was paralyzed. So what happened? Well, she began to believe what her mother said rather than what her doctor said. And there's a quote from her life that is very, very powerful. My doctor told me I would never walk again. My mother told me I would, and I believed my mother. <laughs> And what they did as a family was they wrapped their arms around this little girl and for a number of years, five years to be exact, four times every day, family members rotated massaging her and making sure by praying for her that she was going to be able to do the best that she could. And by the time she was nine years old, Wilma's mother looked out one day and saw her playing basketball with all those other kids out there, and in this case, she was even barefooted. So she went on to become the fastest woman in the world. Now, that made me think of a verse of Scripture that we often use. As a matter of fact, one of the pro basketball players has it written on his shoes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I've always needed to help people with that because you have to have context. When's the last time you saw a five foot five young person say, I'm going to be an all-star NBA basketball player and dunk the ball like crazy? Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I'm sorry, that's not going likely to work. Uh, we, we can, I, I give you a number there. I want to get that new promotion with the corner office. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How about you get uh, ripped in the gym? I can do all things through Christ who, well, let's don't even go there. How about the girl that you're trying to win over and accept her, her invitation to go out? I can do, you know where I'm going, because we need context to this, and this is where I would talk about my own sense of frustration and, and little defeat, feeling of, of, of defeat this year. Because the context of that passage of Scripture is this. You go two verses before it. By the way, whenever you read scripture and you have one verse that leaps off the page, always go back and always go forward to make sure you can make sense of it. It says in uh, two verses before, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do all, I can do all this. That's the actual best translation through him who gives me strength. In other words, I've learned whatever. And I will tell you, in, in the difficulty of our year, you know, we began this year behind on our budget, never have caught up. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust our budget. We will learn to live with a little less this year and next year as we make our budget. We had difficulty in other ways here, many of you are aware of. Well, we, we, we're going to dig in and, and, and keep loving each other and making our way through this. That's what we do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because I've learned to bring balance and hope no matter what the set of circumstances are. Thirdly, and best of all, he saves us from death. This past week, I, I almost it seems almost weekly, I probably do 30 uh, funerals a year. I stood at the graveside with a family, and when I asked them about the family, I, I get called because I do good funerals, I guess, in that I get to know the family and I engage them. And so I get called pretty often, and in this case, 
I sat down with the family and I asked them about lots of th questions about them, but when I asked them about her faith, they said, well, she is a Baptist. Now, do you think that's the answer I wanted to hear? <laughs> uh, guess no. <laughs> Uh, because I really don't really care what denomination she is as much as I believe we Baptists are always right. Um, I, what I care is about her faith, and I did dig into that and get some sense for it. But it reminded me of a couple things. Uh, Jim Harnish, who is a, a pastor who's retired about five or six years ago from Hyde Park uh, Methodist Church in Tampa, uh, I've been very intrigued by his stuff through the years, but even more so I've been reading his blog recently. And uh, I've been designing some of my messages through, um, from, from a guide he wrote a number of years ago in Advent. What I, what I discovered uh, about him was that he knew somebody that I uh, kind of like what I do. And you'll recognize this person. He says uh, the lady that he knew at his church was V. Uh, v uh, Choate, and she was the church's wedding coordinator. And he called her a first-class joy bringer. He said she did everything with military precision. He said as wedding coordinator, he would, she would get the bridesmaids to stand up straight and the groomsmen to spit out their gum and the wedding photographer to obey the church rules. And as he talked about her story, you know where I'm going if you know our church well, and that is that we uh, suffered, I suffered one of the toughest uh, losses uh, that I've, I've suffered since I've been here, and that is uh, the loss of a lady that I uh, dearly love, Ruby Lindner. She passed on September the 16th, and she was, in fact, our wedding coordinator. And having had a fairly tough year, I will tell you that I have probably missed her more this year uh, than I ever expected to. I, I have missed her encouragement to my life in a number of ways. But... Jim Harnish talks about um, talking to her husband who had experienced this. On December the 10th, 2001, she had a car accident and passed. And Jim asked her uh, husband to write an entry into their Advent, and, uh, Advent book for the year. And these were some of the things that he wrote I found very, very powerful. On December the 10th, 2001, the greatest joy of my life was snuffed out. Do what we've always been done is what she, I've decided to do. I've decided to go to church, to sing in the Messiah, to attend a Bible study, to stay close to friends, and not forget to decorate the house with at least two trees. And by doing what I believe V and God wanted me to do, I found out I could still sing Joy to the World and be thrilled by the Hallelujah Chorus. He concluded by saying, The nights are still lonely and some days are longer than others, but God is with me and I have been able to find joy. I felt very much like that this past year. Jim Harnish, when she, he did her funeral, he said these words. Some of us might be tempted to say what Christmas will be almost, that Christmas will be almost unbearable because of V's death. But the deeper truth is that V's death would be almost unbearable were it not for Christmas. And I would say the same about Ruby Linder's death for me. When I stood to do her funeral, uh, months ago now, I went back to the notes this week and I found out where I talked about her redemptive resolve. She had a resolve. She had lost her husband early, many, many years. She had experienced significant pain in her life. But I will tell you, I've never known a more level, steady, joyful person in my life. And uh, certainly she, God gives me in every past church I've ever served a few people who walk alongside me who love me but who also prompt me in just the right balance and she certainly was able to do that so where are you with your disillusionment where are you with the sense of defeat that you have maybe felt this past this past year and where are you with how you stand with death because I will tell you, it is not a good place to stand with a family when they have any level of uncertainty about their loved ones. To hear the cries and the shrieks of anguish at a time when the uncertainty about where their loved one is, well, it's just about beyond what you could stand. 
But on the other hand, when you've known people like Ruby and V, well, you know that heaven rejoices and that you know there's a place for the hallelujah chorus to be sung because Christ has defeated death for you and me. I pulled out one of the best quotes from the Christmas carol, and I want to end with it. Ebenezer Scrooge, after his incredible conversion, says, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, and the spirits of all three shall strive within me, and I shall not shut out the lessons that they teach. I will honor Christmas in my heart. Not a Christmas on the calendar, not a denomination that I belong to. I will honor Christ in my life. And he will love me. And because he loves me, he will cause me to love others. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together.